Tyresha, congratulations um, on bringing the debut film Seller in the Space to Market. Um, I'd imagine there's, there's a whole range of uh, things that you have to do in order to turn concept into creation, mm -hmm. um, which people don't appreciate. So before we even get into the film, can you kind of outline some of the, the things that you had to deal with in order to pull it together? Because I've, I've read a few of your pieces. I don't like to read too much before I do an interview to colour my thinking. I really want to <laughs> kind of just have my own conversation. But um, I read what you wrote with regards to Sundance prior to, to getting involved. I think the Writers Clinic and just not feeling like the idea was was ready. So mm -hmm. just talk about that and just talk about pulling it to, to creation. Yeah. Um... So before I even wrote the feature film, I did a lot of work just building the world and the characters. I made this multimedia project um, called Cell in the Spades and Overture. And it was like a combination of short stories, photographs, short films that I made about Stella and her life and what she wanted out of life. Um, and I did all that because I, I, I didn't know what I wanted a feature film about Stella to be about. Um, and so for me, I needed to figure out all the details of the world before I could figure out the story itself. Um, and then, then I wrote a feature film. <laughs> I wrote the script, I took it to the Sundance Screenwriting Labs. Um, and the brilliant thing about going there was just that they don't care how done you think your work is because they'll tell you that it's not done. Um, and I, I really like and I really like that way of, of just doing work, especially creative work, where you're sort of forced to put your ego aside and just focus on getting this work correct. And, um, I, and just like the, the, the advice that I got was invaluable. Um, but it was really just like, I'm the kind of writer who does a lot of drafts of something. I like to get it all out on the page in that first go or the first draft really quickly. And then I like to spend time inside the story, spend time inside the script, trying new things, throwing everything away, trying it again. I just like to take my time working on it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it does. Because obviously it gives us insight into, again, one can appreciate the film for itself but just that mm -hmm. whole process beforehand of, yeah of, of bringing it to market and just the things that you have to deal with yeah it's, and then after like even getting your script to a place where you feel like yeah this is done for sure then you have the whole question of how do I get this movie financed and like actually yeah, make course. a movie which is I think where a lot of folks I mean where that's what uh, where a lot of folks can relate or that's a roadblock that a lot of folks can relate to rather um and for me and for us it, it really didn't come together until i mean we had like institutional support um through grants from this organization center h who's just been like mentor day one above and beyond organization to work with um but it didn't our financing didn't really come together until we'd had the opportunity to go through this thing called sundance catalyst where they like put a bunch of investors and production companies into an auditorium and you get to pitch to them um, so from that, and just me and our lead producer, Lauren McBride, being on stage, being ourselves and telling everybody in the audience, if you join this project, you're cool, <laughs> so come be cool with us, um, and just convincing them that this is the hot thing. <laughs> um, and it worked. And from there, we, we had this consortium of investors who just were down for the ride and down to help us. <laughs> um, and I, I definitely... I really liked the experience of making my first feature that way because it felt like such a community building experience and it wasn't right. like one company giving us the money and telling us what to do and getting final cut, but it felt like such a more collaborative experience. If you could indulge me for a second um, sure. to get into elements of the movie I, I kind of most resonated with. Um, I guess most of those were centered around the performance of the main character, Lovey Simone Seller. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought it was a, a beautifully executed performance of a, a complex character. Um, so how, how did it resonate on set and, and what was it about Lovey that um, won you over in the casting? Uh, Lovey as a person is really goofy. <laughs> like she's very, she's just like, she's a little kid. I mean, when we, when I first met her, she was 18 and she's about five feet tall, really petite 
but just has like a she's like a giant bundle of energy and she's really goofy she's constantly cracking jokes she's always dancing and laughing and sharing music and so <laughs> it was wild to go from seeing her tape like her audition tape and seeing her in character as Stella and have this like larger than life sort of uh, presence on screen and then to meet this very petite, very small, very goofy human being, um, and very loving human being, an extremely expressive person. So I, I think, honestly, like, I realized that Lovey, or it, like, as soon as I saw her, I wanted to work with her. As soon as I saw the video, I knew that I needed to have her be a part of the movie. But as soon as I met her in person, that was when I realized how perfect the choice was, because she's so not a Sella that in a way she had so like her being so not Sella created within her so much empathy and compassion for Sella that she never talked about Sella as being evil or bad or a villain ever like we never talked about Sella that way on set in prep in production it was very important for me and became so important for Lovey that people understood that Sella is the hero of her story so like let her fuck up let her make mistakes but don't take that away from her you can't we won't let you. So I, I just, that made a huge difference. And also just like having, which is weirdly not as common as you would think it should be, but like having a teenager play a teenager made a huge difference. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like letting yeah. them be their teenage selves and bring yeah. that teenage goofiness to the role make it like it's invaluable. I don't know why we don't do that more. Probably various reasons for that. Talk about the story. <laughs> Talk about the story a bit more. Talk yeah. about what motivated you to pull that unconventional story to together, because it is an unconventional story, especially told from that perspective and and the optics. Mm -hmm. Yes, the optics. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I went to boarding school for high school, um, and my school had a large endowment, so I was able to offer really generous financial aid packets, which is how I was able to go. Um, and so it, it was like leaving the world of West Philadelphia and entering this bubble of absolute privilege that I both knew I had access to, but also understood how it was not my world when I leave this bubble. Um, and so I just became really fascinated with that specific high school experience, the experience of leaving home and living elsewhere, but you're not like down and out on your luck. You're not destitute. You have walked into luxury. Um, so I wanted to capture that feeling. And then more, I mean, it's, it, it felt like growing up, um, being a teenager, seeing movies and TV shows, like a lot of the stories about black kids were either Black kids going through and facing trauma after trauma after trauma, typically through, or typically at the hands of white supremacy, systemic oppression, things like that. Or it was like a black kid as an example of a model minority, like a kid who gets the perfect grades, always does the right thing, helps their mom, loves their brother, like is just a good person. Mm. Because when I was a teenager, I felt like I just felt like I was alive. <laughs> I just felt like I'm just doing my best. Like I'm just trying to be alive. I'm trying to be a person. I don't know if I want to be a good person. I, I, my life wasn't particularly traumatic, but at the same time, I understood that being a black kid growing up in America, also my parents were, are like Pan-African academic revolutionary. So I never could escape the knowledge of what white supremacy was and how it affected my life. Mm -hmm. But I felt as though, or I feel as though, I felt as though if everything that I saw was either trauma or model minority, then how am I supposed to understand or how am I supposed to feel like I'm being seen or how am I supposed to feel seen rather by media? And so I just like, it kind of boiled down to this or, or rather like, it's not a question of not liking, it's not a question of us not accepting tales of anti-heroes, obviously, because we have these shows like The Sopranos or Breaking Bad. We have movies like The Godfather. We have, you know, um, all these gangster movies starring white guys. And they get away with things. And I just wanted to, I started to have this desire to just see somebody like me acting questionably 
in terms of morality and mm-hmm. getting away with things. I just wanted to see somebody like me struggling with these ideas of what is struggling with this idea of when is enough power or when do I have enough power? Like, when can I stop this quest for more power? I wanted to see somebody who looked like me selling drugs and like, it doesn't make them a bad person. I wanted to see somebody who looked like me taking drugs and not making them a bad person. I think it was just like, I knew that I liked these sorts of stories, these anti-hero stories, and I just wanted to feel like I could be a part of them. That's really where Cell in the Spades came from. I, I get why you had rave reviews because that was that that explains why the complexity is so well delivered just from my own personal point of view. I'm conscious that um our viewers, readers, um they should know a little bit about you. So you know, for those who are watching Sarah the Spades uh on Amazon Prime video, April seventeenth. But who yes. is who is the director, the writer? Where does she come from? I mean, I know you're from West Philly. You've touched on that already. But <laughs> I, I mean, talk about how you find yourself in this position today. As succinctly as you can, because I, I appreciate you touched on your parents just now and how yeah. they've influenced you growing up. So colour colour between the lines for me. Well, <laughs> uh, I have a large family. I have a lot of brothers. Um, uh, my parents influenced me probably most or more than anybody in my entire life because they're the sort of people who never just tell they never told us no you can't do this thing and then didn't explain why everything from them involved like a deep explanation and if you wanted to do something that they didn't think that you should do you always had the chance to basically convince them so I like they raised us with an eye towards dialogue basically um and I think that that just caused me to always be questioning things and <laughs> wondering why I can't have things the way I think they should be if I can get it done. I don't know. It's, it's, I, I don't know. This sounds so cocky. I don't know. Um, I think my parents, because of their, I don't know, my parents just raised us with the idea that we could do anything and we can do anything. And <laughs> like, I just leaned into that hard, which in a way made making a movie easier because a lot of getting funding and financing for a film is people telling you what you're trying to do isn't possible and what you're trying to do isn't necessary. And so it does require knowing or having like this, this belief in your own gut, um, this unshakable belief in your gut feeling and you know, this unshakable belief in your intuition. Um, And I think that, and having this unshakable belief in your intuition and being able to look somebody who's telling you you can't do something, look them in the eye and tell them that you can do it and then just go do it. So I don't know. I think like, I think because my parents are the way that they are and raised us the way that they were, I, I'm just used to just figuring it out and getting it done. And I think that that's a lot of filmmaking, but particularly when it's your first feature film and you're a black woman in America and people are very eager to tell you, you can't do something. Um, That doesn't touch me. I can do it. I know I can't. I know who my parents raised, like chill. So (laughs) I do think that had a huge effect. Um, And I think that it's, uh, it's something that I try to, it's something that I, I guess, harp on with others. Um, yeah, I believe in the gut feeling. I believe in listening to that. Black female directors, eh? Hell yeah. <laughs> the, the you mean like them. a I mean, thousand let's, more. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk about how the future is mm-hmm. going to spawn more people with that self-determination that you've just, uh, you've just outlined. Just talk about that yeah. being a, a new narrative. And actually, we're going we're gonna to redress the balance that we've seen over the last, I don't know, forever. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, it's like what I see or what's so exciting about releasing this movie right now is that I don't feel like the only person in the room at all. Um, I don't think there's enough people in the room who look like me, but I I, like I I don't feel like, oh, this is me beating this lone drum alone. And I've never really felt that way because of this community around me. Um, And I'm really excited for (laughs) I'm really excited for all the Black women who grew up Black girls not being told what to do. Mm. I'm just excited for us to keep making movies because 
because we're also people who grew up during those times when wherever we live in the world, but let's just say Hollywood, because I live in the States where Hollywood was only telling certain types of stories about black people. We all grew up through that. We all saw it. We all felt like, Hmm, this is great, but there's a lot more to know. And there's a lot more to say. It's just about, so what I'm seeing now and what I'm excited for about the future is a bunch of black people making movies that center blackness and that aren't told through, you know, this lens of what do white people think about black people? Or how do white people affect our lives and our identity and our view of ourselves, but rather are concerned with blackness at their center. And I think that that makes such a huge difference. And it really requires gatekeepers to, it requires, well, it requires more gatekeepers to look like us, but even more than that, it requires gatekeepers to not need to insert themselves into the conversation, but just to like step aside and let us do it. Create the path. And watch yeah. what happens next. Yeah. <laughs> I hate no, I tell you, I'm listen, I'm with you. Um I'm conscious of my time, right? And I know how, how the PR are, so <laughs> I want to get these questions in. So sure. the elephant in the room or outside of the room that's kept us in the room. How are you coping? COVID nine, coronavirus. Yeah. How are you dealing with? Um, I mean I'm I'm coping with it. I'm healthy, my family's healthy. Um but I think this is the weirdest time of my life. <laughs> like, it's just not, hold on one second. Sorry. Sorry. There's a smoothie being made in the other room. Um, uh, yeah, this is the weirdest time of my life. I don't really, uh, I, I think even more than the illness itself, the virus itself and the effects, like the health effects on people, it's the, at least realizing in the U.S. in particular, um, realizing the failings of your entire government, <laughs> like the financial system and knowing and having known that these things are true and and being raised to understand that like capitalism is not really going to help us in the future it's 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 been kind of heartbreaking to watch Mm. it's been it's been heartbreaking um and, and it's also like you know i feel like we tend to lean on each other in moments like these. Like we really get a lot from being able to gather together and have our voices be heard by just shouting together. And it's, it's been really odd to have that like need for community and not be able to access it physically speaking. So it's been tough, but I don't know. We're all going through it. And tell me, yeah, <laughs> no, like I said, you're my first interview. So like, it's there so you go. <laughs> Yeah. Um, lastly, because I've just got the two minute prompt. You are obviously going to be writing a series at some stage um, mm-hmm. for Amazon Prime TV video. Um, talk about what that means to you and just, just the future as succinctly as you can. I want to tell as many stories and write as many stories, movies, TV shows, whatever, books, anything with people who look like me at the center of the story. So that's what my future holds, quite honestly. Um, And that's something that I've been pushed, not, that's just something that feels like such a given for me. I guess I kind of think about it in the way, or I ask myself the question, how many white men have made movies about other white men? And it's like a lot. So until I match those numbers, I'm gonna keep writing stories about folks who look like us. And on that note, I wish you were the best. (laughs) Thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time. Appreciate your creativity and what you're delivering out here. So I really appreciate that. No worries. Good luck in these strange times, all right? Thank you. Stay safe. You too. You too. Best of luck. You.